Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here in the afternoon to uh, discuss with us about this very important thematic, the early childhood support in developing countries. It's a, it's a session focusing developing countries, and I'm very glad as a member of HI, Humanity and Inclusion, to facilitate this session. My name is Hervé Bernard. I will tell you a bit more about my organization, HI, in a few minutes. But I would like first to introduce the panelists here that will uh, have a short introduction also of their projects and uh, practices before we change all together as, as a room. So I have the pleasure to uh, introduce you, uh, Eddie, coming from uh, Indonesia. Yes. And uh, he represents a movement of disabled person organization. And he will explain how this uh, structure is uh, able to propose interesting services for children with disability in Indonesia. We'll after, we will move to uh, you, Annette, mm -hmm. in order to understand how a foundation, the Karuna Foundation, can also participate to this uh, commitment to make early childhood more inclusive and uh, uh, work on the inclusion of children in developing countries. And I think you will take the example of Nepal. Yes. And uh, finally, we will have the pleasure to welcome Mr. Nitin from India, who has a different uh, organization. It's a for-profit organization working for children with disabilities in India, and he will explain us how it is possible to uh, make this uh, for-profit and uh, social issues working together. So a bit of background for the organization I work with. Uh, I work for HI, Inclusion, um, Humanity and Inclusion, named for, formerly before we were named Handicap International. It's an international organization working in 60 countries around the world. We are trying to have a comprehensive approach of disability, supporting them whatever they face of difficulties, if it is a humanitarian crisis or a development issue. We support them uh, regarding access to rehab services, access to health services, of course, but also access to, let's say, social services. I'm in charge especially of the education and employment uh, unit, where we try to support uh, children and youth and adults with disabilities to have a normal life and access to mainstream services, whatever context they are living in. Um, when we talk about childhood in uh, HI, we, uh, of course, in uh, childhood and uh, remote area, we think about CBR, community-based rehabilitation. And I think that's a topic that we'll mention this afternoon. And I uh, hope we can also have, take this opportunity to uh, see what's going on on CBR and how these different uh, uh, projects that we will see from Indonesia, Nepal, and India are participating to the evolution of, of the CBR that has been created uh, 20 years ago by w, WHO. Um, I want also to insist on the social aspect of uh, CBR and uh, in our approach, we try to insist on the fact that uh, social worker or community worker are key to make a good success in the inclusion process. So I'm sure as well that uh, the different participants will insist on that. But for HI, it is uh, uh, the obligation to work on the skills and uh, the way you can sustain community workers, social workers with the right uh, social background and the right attitudes toward children and adults with disability. We have developed for that an approach called personalized social support approach to be sure that all our staff and all our partners have the right uh, skills and attitudes when they are dealing with social inclusion of per persons with disabilities. When we talk about childhood also, we think about uh, mental health and psychosocial issues because many children with disabilities are facing some traumatized and some violence at home or in the society. And like we are doing, for example, in Lebanon, we are supporting uh, stakeholders within the camps, uh, Palestinian camps, or any other uh, new camps that are now happening in, uh, in Lebanon, to develop specific mental health and psychosocial care for children with disability in this specific context. 
it's, uh, it's also an issue that is uh, tricky because of the lack of uh, expert and psychologists, psychiatric in this uh, remote area. But it's worth the challenge when we uh, face all the difficulties of children can have in this such a context of a camp that exists now since uh, 1948 in, in Lebanon. Another issue is protection. I mentioned before the traumatized the violence, but also it's very important to uh, protect children with disability regarding all kinds of violence that exist. For example, in Ethiopia, we are developing a project to protect children in remote and rural areas of bad treatments or that can come from the parents, from the neighborhood, or from community services that sometimes can not be at the providing the right uh, support to children and really bring and arm them in their daily life. I would like also to insist on education. When we talk about childhood, we also offer a lot of uh, support to education services, mainstream services, to be sure that the school, as the main service where children are faced, is really able to include them uh, to provide the right uh, pedagogy, the right uh, trainings, but also to be a safe place for them when they can grow and learn uh, in full security. That's something very important, especially in the Sahel region these days, in Burkina Faso or in Mali, with all the, the turbulence that uh, the country faces in the north of the country. It's very important to consider the school as a place where, where children can feel safe and comfortable and, of course, where they can learn uh, important skills for their futures. And I will finish with a, a combined project that we are leading thanks to the IKEA Foundation. Uh, it's another project we are working in different camps in uh, Thailand, in Burma, in Bangladesh or in Pakistan to focus on the childhood in camps and to see how we can propose different services, community services that make them childhood much more uh, inclusive and much more uh, efficient for their development. So we combine sports, leisure activity, with education activity, with protection activities, with mental health activity. It's a full combination, a uh, full package of services that can exist at local level with local resources because we don't have expertise that can be uh, mobilized in these settings. And it's, uh, it's a great project that we, uh, uh, that we are very proud to, uh, to develop these days. I will not go further now, but I wanted to introduce the childhood perspective with all these elements from protection, mental health issue, but also education and social dimension. And uh, hopefully that will be also the uh, food for thought for the different questions that you will have after the presentation. I will now leave the floor to you, uh, Eddie, to introduce um, yourself first, a bit of your organization, and tell us more about what you are doing as a disabled person organization in uh, Indonesia. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Eddie Sufrianta from uh, Sahati Sukarjo in Central Java in Indonesia. My program in increased uh, access to ed education and health services for children with disability. Uh, my activity in my program uh, Sanggar Inclusi or Inclusion Club. Sanggar Inclusi is place uh, for the children with disability and their family and then can increase their capacity to make children with more independent for using community resources. In one place, children with disability families of children with disability, volunteers, therapists, tutor, and com uh, community to the activity to cater. Children can play, learn, and get therapy that has done by provisional therapies as physiotherapy, occupation therapy, and speech therapy. Family of children with disability of offshore and learn how to do therapy at home. So when the I went back home, they have got many knowledge about how to their children and practice 
at home. Sehati Sukaharjo uh, is an NGO that from grassroots DBOs Sehati Sukarjo is a grassroots DPO which is very close with the environment of person with disability in village. I have to know Sehati has many members that come from various sub-districts in Sukarjo district. Start from, start from 2016, Sehati work in program Peduli that support by Yakum Rehabilitation Center the Asia Foundation and Australian government in increase social inclusion for people with disability in Indonesia. Background, there is no person with disability organization that many of them are living in the village with severe condition and their family do not take care of them. Lack of family understanding about how to treat person with disability. Heart, education services are far away from home. The cost for health and education services from children with disability is very expensive. Children with disability are living with family for 24 hours, but they only have three or four hours in which to have services in Sanggar Inclusi. Essence Sanggar Inclusi, the essence of project are the improvement of education of and sorry. The improvement of education and health services access for children with disability by increasing family of children with disability or volunteers capacity and treatment children with disability. One raising family awareness about children potency and how to de develop it. Training on how to treat children with disability. Practice on how to treat children with disability at Sanggar in, and at home by professional assistant. Monitoring on fa uh, family abilities on practicing their skills. Sharing between family of children with disability. Peer of uh, parents. Governance on community involvement. Heart worker, educator, and local community in Sanggar Inclusive Activity. One, local community and government involvement in family forum established activity. Health workers and education involvement to be the speaker in Sanggar Inclusive Activity. Forum of family with disability and children with disability participate in community social activities. I'm sorry. Yep. Innovative aspect program. Sangar Inclusi is model head and education services for children with disability in rural community. There are some innovative aspects from program including parents <coughs> and families of children with disability are involved and having response responsible in children development. Voluntary professional par participation from cross sector government, health, education, children protection, social sector, and private sector, individual and business companies. That participating in inclusive, in Sanggar inclusive activity is. Parent Parents and family of children with disability have skill in educating, educating or doing simple therapies at home. 
sharing between families of students with disability to share their knowledge and empowering its elders. Impact created by the program. There are some impact the created by the project, including the recent of uh, the recession of habitation and starting from village for children with disability, the improvement of had education service of children with disability, the improvement uh, the improvement of family and volunteers capacity in treating uh, treat, treating children with disability, had an education service for children with disability uh, closure. The importance of local government and uh, community awareness. They are 2024 children with disability have got health educa health and education services in nine Shanghai inclusive has formed in Indonesia district, uh, in Sukaharja district. Before we join, join Sanggar Inclusive, had go to uh, Surakarta to the therapy for Septiana, uh, the best uh, stock day. Uh, financing, sustainable, uh, sustainability and challenge. Sanggar Inclusive get its funding from firm uh, contribution every month, government and local donors, uh, communities. Sanggar Inclusive and main activity from uh, of student with disability, family and having, feeling and sense belonging and on Sanggar inclusion. Challenge, they are manifesting how their children with disability re recover the limit capacity of founders so the court not treat all disability TPIs. Limited facility and interpreter. Next time, initiating CBR Information and Development Center. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eddie. So I think we we all notice that uh, the, the important work that you are you are doing and, and the impact you managed to have. Yeah, I think you raised some questions that will will come, and, and I think with the other panelists, we also work on this issue of impact and how to measure impact of such uh, social activities, social services, and the question of volunteer, uh, how to make volunteer. Uh, able to continue to maintain this dynamic in the, in the long run and also the question of sustainability of course of such uh, services where we cannot accept or uh, ask any contribution or high contribution from poor, poor families. So I will now turn to uh, you Annette and see how you can also give us uh, some interesting uh, feedback of your, uh, of your work you are doing with your organization in, uh, on connection with uh, childhood. And I think you will talk about the Nepal experience. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, two years back, I met Surya. This is Surya. She's living in a small village in the mountains of Nepal, and she is born with a severe dis disability. Her father disappeared after her birth. Her mother died in her first year, so she stayed with her grandparents, and in fact, she didn't leave the house. She stayed in bed for six years. Um, until uh, the Inspire to Care program uh, entered the village and supported her. So, with the help of Karuna Foundation and the Inspire to Care program, the first thing is that she was recognized as a human being in the village. She got an ID card, so she was recognized by the government and got access to services. With the help of our facilitators, she learned to sit, even stand, and read and got access to school. And what I saw when I was there was, of course, very proud grandparents, but also extremely proud um, leaders in the village. They were so proud that they could take responsibility for taking care of children like Surya. And in fact, that's um, what we at the Corona Foundation, why we dream of introducing this program in all villages of Nepal, to make sure that not only Surya gets this support, but all others who need. 
My name is uh, Annette van den Hoek. I'm director of the Corona Foundation. I just started in uh, January, so um, it's uh, still brand new, but I'm very excited um, to tell a little bit more about the program. So what we do is that we um, strengthen local health institutions and institutions like uh, parent groups, local leaders, in villages. We increase local financing in order to make sure that we can implement this program focusing on prevention of handicaps and rehabilitation of people with a handicap. We, as I just told you, we dream about introducing this program in the whole country. But as a Karuna Foundation, we focus on the implementation in one province, the east in the east of Nepal. And uh, with the idea that after we started implementing this program in province number one, the government, provincial governments in, in the rest of the country will adopt the program. We establish resource and training centers so to make sure that we can train and strengthen the capacity of the other uh, um, uh, provincial authorities and health institutions. In fact, we had the idea of starting in province number one in six districts, which is already a huge challenge. But then in the uh, meetings with the provincial government, they said, well, we are so enthusiastic about this program, we really want to adopt it, but under the condition that we cover the whole province and not only six districts. Because that is, you know, if we cover the whole province, we are willing to adopt our policy, we are willing to change the budget, budget allocation for these kind of programs. So here we are with the challenge of in, uh, implementing the program not in six, but in 14 districts. Well, how does it work? If we enter the, 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 is the Corona Foundation, enter a village, the first thing is that they, um, they check whether a village is ready for this program. So we call it a kind of assessment, a readiness assessment, looking at the motivation of the local leaders and looking at their uh, financial resources available. Maybe it's good to explain you that uh, since last year, municipalities have an elected mayor and uh, they have budget reserved for these kind of programs, but nobody knows how to use them or nobody's aware of it. So we can benefit from this, uh, from this institution to make this program happen. Well, then after we find that these villages are really committed and motivated, we Together with them, they select, an, we call it a community-based rehabilitation facilitator. So it is somebody from the community who will go door to door to identify disabled children and uh, adults and make sure they get the proper care. Besides that, we almost also have our prevention program. So we work together with the, what we call the community-based um, the female health volunteers, and we train them in order to make sure that they improve the quality of their care. So we start implementing the program, making sure they get access to physiotherapy, education, um, uh, knowledge about uh, antenatal care or prenatal care. And then after two and a half years, we exit. So we, after two and a half years, we believe that villagers are capable to continue the program uh, uh, by them. Uh, own means. Well, what makes it innovative? Well, we focus on developing inclusive societies, as we call it. Um, we have strong conditions, three conditions for starting. We also stopped in the past already in the village, as we noticed that some villagers were not uh, uh, sufficiently, sufficiently motivating. Um, we developed a very scalable model, um, which was not easy because it has to be a very mean, lean program in order to make it adoptable to the program, to the government. Um, what's also innovative is that we formed a consortium of funders. We have three funders in the Netherlands who committed to fund for six years in six districts, which is um, uh, super, and we, um, which is not innovative, but it is uh, maybe interesting that we have, we start an external impact research to really identify the impact of this program. Well, looking at cost, you can see the whole program, the cost is 107,000 euro uh, for the two and a half years in the village. The village will continue the program for 22,000 uh, euro uh, after we have left and it will end up in an investment of one euro per inhabitant to run this program in their own village. We do see some challenges. 
Of course, one is um, that we are in um, discussion with the provincial government. We have developed a memorandum of understanding and we really hope they will sign by the end of next month to make sure that we can, they can allocate the budgets in time. Um, of course, we have the ambition that the whole the, although federal government will adopt the program. Uh, and that's, of course, also um, uh, something that we uh, have to lobby and advocate for. Um, we have a funding gap of 5 million because the government in the province number one said we, you need to cover the whole province and not only six districts. And, of course, we realize this scaling is a huge challenge for the uh, uh, organization. You know, we... In the past five years, we have worked in less than one district, and now we're going to replicate the program in 14 districts. We have to start a resource and training center, and we have to make sure that we have the financial management, technology development all in place. So um, we're working on it, and um, um, we're looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Annette, for this uh, very good uh, experience that we are uh, in process, in fact, and I understand the, the challenges ahead, but I, I really appreciate the fact that you plan uh, all the financial aspects and you can really detail the cost of the replication, the cost for the municipality and the cost for the federal government, because, uh, that, again, there's no possibility to maintain this uh, social dynamic without a strong commitment of local authorities and national authorities. Let's now go to a, a third model of uh, CBR, or uh, social uh, care of uh, children with disability. We are now heading to uh, India, and uh, with uh, you, Nitin, you will give us uh, an, ex an interesting experience that you are leading with your for-profit organization, named Moms Believes. So the floor is yours, Nitin, and let you introduce yourself. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Heavy lunch, right? Let's try again. Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning. Hi. I'm Nitin Benlish. I'm founder CEO of Mons Belief. Uh, it's a social enterprise, and we empower parents with special need kids. Just to give a background on Mons Belief, we incubated four years back with following thoughts. Hope. Hope is the greatest factor we want to tell a parent that there is a way. Our vision, we want to empower parents so that they become a co-therapist for their own child. Our mission, we want to cover one million families in the next 10 years, not by ourselves, but with a network of professionals working with us. Our program started operationally last year after three years of research and development by an excellent, talented clinical team. I'll not go through the data. It's like preaching to the choir to this forum. Just one point from my behalf, it's a global issue. Irrespective of caste, creed, or financial status, you'll see special need kids everywhere across. Now, what is Mons Belief? Mons Belief is an initiative in empowering parents of special need kids. We empower a mother to become a co-therapist, by providing teaching tools, training, support, at their convenience at home. What all we cover? We cover autism, Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, learning disability, which include dyslexia, dysgraphia, intellectual disability, ADHD, which is a very prominent these days, and other mental related issues. How we do that? We do that by providing professional support and therapy tools delivered at home which is a priority, but off late, we have seen that schools and center are warm, warmly welcoming us to partner with them and take it forward. We are operationally a year in, in, in uh, active, and we have 1,200, more than 1,200 families enrolled, most of them in the home program, but schools and institutions are catching up. The prominent factor is, out of those 1,200, we cover 114 cities in India, and the majority of the percentage is tier two and tier three, where they have no access, forget about the access, they are no doctor in the 50 kilometer radius, forget about a therapy center. We have more than 21,000 Facebook families with us registered, which shows that clearly there's a demand, and that's why we have a great clinical team, so far nearly 300 
clinicians working with us, and by end of next year, or in, in next 12 months, we, we look to double that from the clinical perspective. Now the left hand side is the real problem and issues and the right side wants to create a solution. The most important issue is the shortage of professional and that can be taken over by empowering parent. Let me take a quick example. In India alone you have 15 million autistic kids and there are thousands, only thousands of clinicians. Even if those clinicians work round the clock 24 seven, they can't provide even one hour of therapy to these kids. Now imagine a world for this 15 million kid, you have 30 million parents. Two is to one, and all working together for that kid. That will change the world. Even if they do 70% rather than 100%, they'll still impact in their life. Secondly is the affordability. It's very extensive, cost extensive, and we want to be 20, 30%. And lastly, this industry is very highly unorganized. There are great professionals, many professionals working fantastic work, but in silos. We want to create a scalable ecosystem which is tech enabled for these children and for this industry. How we do that, just a quick process. We enroll a parent, we assign a, assign a dedicated child psychologist and a doctor. We create, do, do a neurodevelopment profiling and then we prepare a tailor-made report and IP for the child and send the bag across to the home and train mother and track on short-term and long-term goals. Financing sustainability, we have completed $1 million of funding and few million dollars we are going to raise from certain institutes and government funds. Uh, we are for profit organization. This is why we want to make ourselves uh, self-sustainable. We have monthly affordable subscription program based on the services. The challenge is, um, which is opportunity as well, that we want to partner with like-minded folks and the government. And the most important challenge would give me practically a sleepless night, it's scaling up while maintaining the quality and clinical excellence. Moms believe we want, it's all about quality and clinical excellence because that is non-negotiable. Growth, and quickly we want to have 10,000 kids in the next two years for half a dozen countries, and a few years later, 450,000 kids in a few dozen countries. Our aim is to touch and improve one million families in the next 10 years, not by ourselves, but through fantastic support from the clinicians, professional, and eminent leader, like all of you sitting across in the room. Now, I'll be honest, I might sound a bit, bit uh, overambitious, but we at Mons Belief really, really think that we are motivated by a problem uh, which is so big and encouraged by the parent and listening to those parents. I would like to show you a video where the, the, we are summarizing the overall issue and what parent has to say about the journey and experience. Been a journey of a lot of uh, patience, determination. The social uh, environment around you does not understand special needs and because perhaps due to its lack of understanding starts, you start getting ostracized. So what would be the best remedy? What would be, who would be the right person? Is always something which we want to know, but we do not know. We stop believing in all the theories and all the predictions and I started believing in Pranav. If you choose to learn and understand and you become a doctor yourself in a lot of ways because you know your child best. I realize that that's what's going to work and that is what has actually worked for him. But let nobody take that away from a mum that uh, what your nurturing and nourishing abilities to your child can bring about the change Possibly nothing else can. There's an inspiring line we've used for our children on their t-shirts in colors white on red or red on white which says autistic and proud of it. Now I'm able to graduate that line a little higher and say parent of an autistic boy and proud and happy about it.
Just I want to conclude with one thing. We have one motto. No child should be left behind. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Nitin, for this very powerful presentation. So we have now three different models, three different experiences, that are all reaching the same goals to improve childhood of uh, children with disability, to make them happy and enjoy their life in Indonesia, in Nepal, in India, with different scales, of course. Uh, always impressed by how India managed to have immediately huge millions of scales when in Africa we struggle to have dozens of impact. But uh, yes, that's also how we, we can learn from each other which is from a different continents. So in, a, in HI, we always try, to, when we develop a project, to make a good system, to work on the system, to be sure that the communities play their role, the parents and all the neighborhood, where the services, the professional play also the strong role because they have some expertise uh, to uh, to, um, to be mobilized, and we have the local authority and national authority. And all of this system must, be, must work well if you want duplication, replication, and sustainability. So we have, I think, all of the three projects there are, they are struggling to replicate and to imagine the future. You have lots of ambition, and that's, that's great. All of you wish to uh, develop in more uh, districts, in more regions, in all over the country and all over the world, for some of you. So I would like to, to get also some uh, questions maybe from, from the floor that you will have regarding all the presentation that you, you had uh, this afternoon, uh, whether it is about the system, is it the DPO involvement in such a system, or foundation, the NGO side, or the social enterprise side. I think we have a question there where maybe the mic can go or you can use your mic, please. I will, yes. <laughs> Hi. Um, I have more of a general question. Uh, so I've been listening to, to your presentations and they were very like interesting, but I was missing something. You know, I, I know that access to health and empowerment of, of family society is an important step, but what I was missing a bit in, in your uh, stories was actually how do you involve the disabled children to make sure that it's no longer a special thing, it is just an access need that the child has that can be remedied by the community the child lives in. So it's not only empowering the parents, it's empowering the children, talking to the children, making sure that the systems come from their needs and their demands, and then the end goal should be to create a society where the barriers are taken away from the start. Because if you, for instance, go house to house to every family and say, do you have a disabled? A child or do you have a child who would need extra support, then when the stigma is still there, this will be a major barrier. So my question to all of you is, how do you involve children, empower also children, to actually speak for themselves and be empowered and be strong? Or, yeah, that's the, the question. Thank you. Thank you. So the question of empowerment, put the children at the center of the project, who wants to, do you have all experience in that, maybe? Um, well, the way um, they work in Nepal is that this community facilitator sits together with the children and the parents to develop a plan for uh, uh, what they need and how to achieve it. That's one step. So there the child is involved. Um, another answer is that um, when the children, that, that in each village we organize children clubs, so the children together uh, well, learn from each other and strengthen each other and uh, in order to um, uh, further develop themselves. Yep. Um, excellent question and that's the, there are n number of real problem and this is one of them. I can answer from Mons Belief perspective. At Mons Belief as an organization, every three years we pick a task that what should be the goal for next three years. So for this year we have picked the early childhood intervention. You absolutely right, vocational, vocational empowerment of our special need children so that they have earning, they, they can work, they can become computer programmer, designer, whatever they want to, should be the next step in the evolution of, of any structure. But, but if you ask me from Mons Belief perspective, 
that that going to come after three years and how we are and how we are planning to do that is we need to identify or we are already in the process to identify the key skill of every special needs kid there, there is always a key skill where the kid can be developed upon we want to organization like microsoft and all those organization to come along and train and skill make skill those particular children and then deploy in their structure. So we have a very small level of inclusion in the workplace right now. We want to increase that and we are working towards that. Maybe Eddie, you want to add something regarding uh, Indonesia experience? Uh, from the Indonesian experience? Uh, mereka datang. Uh, ada bertemu, ada kelompok orang tua. There is a, uh, there is a parent meeting. Untuk, uh, saling berkunjung ke rumah -rumah. So they can sometimes they uh, go to other kids who disables, uh, like a, a visit them. Their motivation to family. So they can motivate each other. So between the parent, uh, disabled parent, uh, they they can they able to motivate each other when they can see each other because they have uh, some type of meeting. Keluarga dengan anaknya seminggu sekali datang ke Sanggar Inklusi. Sometimes the family also come to the uh, to the club, and untuk they can introduce themselves to the kids and to the other. Terapi. So most of the most of the parent, uh, the one with the kid who disables, uh, uh, one of the kid uh, sometimes need of the therapies. So while the kid Education. doing the therapies, the parent. Uh, Edukasi. Ada um, untuk ada, uh, there is some uh, education too, and sometimes the parents see it and they can uh, learn from other parents how how to handle uh, because they are different different disability. Okay, thank you very much. I can also add that uh, the experience we have with the IKEA project in the camps for the children. We try to mobilize children to participate to the project design and project cycle. I know that many organizations try now to also mobilize children for the whole process of the project management. It's a real challenge uh, to make it real and to, to avoid to make a, a fake participation, but really to ask children to be part of the design evaluation, but also propose some adjustment for the project, and it's a very interesting uh, topic that uh, I encourage you to, to organize. Is there any other questions in the, in the room regarding the three presentations? Nepal, India, or Indonesia? Any questions? Any feedback parallel with your project, maybe, that you have? Sounds good and clear for everyone. I have some questions, don't worry. Yeah, I want to, to, uh, to question you about the scaling up. I think it's an important thematic that comes very most of the time in your presentation. And uh, one uh, difficulty we face is uh, the difficulty to find money, of course, to scale up, but the difficulty to maintain the quality. Mm -hmm. Because when we do a pilot, it's sometimes we have more energy, more resources, more, res more HR people. But when we have to scale up, most of the time we have to revise a bit the, the target. So how do you deal with that and how are you ready to maybe to, to revise your expectation when you will scale up the project? I'll, I'll take this one because that, that's the real, the real problem. So yes, the pilot is, is always very aggressive. Uh, there's a small team who is very committed, but when you, when you put it in the production or operation, when the rubber hits the road, then you get to know the various realities. Few of the things which Mons Belief is working on to have the scalability and quality is, is investing on the talent. That's the most important thing. And like I said, we are a for-profit organization. We want to hire the best talent, train them, uh, not only from the degree which they have come from, but, but on the certain skills which we know will work on those particular children. And, and that's the way to scale up. So always invest in the talent, groom them, and, and give them empowerment, give them authority that they can work on those child or those children as their own. So that's the way we work and want to maintain the clinical excellence across. Thank you. Annette, you have any issues on that as well? Well, I um, had the opportunity to visit an organization called Living Goods. They work in East Africa. 
and I learned a lot from them about um, um, scaling. So um, what I took from them is uh, one thing is standardization. So if you want to maintain a quality, you have really to be strict on the standard procedures for these volunteers, for the facilitators on how to um, how to work. Um, another um, element I learned from them is uh, technology development. So in, if you want to scale and you want to give the government tools to really manage the healthcare program properly, you really need to invest in technology management in order to develop a performance management uh, system. So um, those are two things that we are really going to um, have a, a good look at. Thank you, Annette. Eddie, any... Okay, from the Indonesian perspective, uh, at the moment we are uh, in, in government involving, even though only uh, so much, uh, little percentage, and we still need uh, uh, some type of professional to maintain these children uh, disabled capability. Of course, um, uh, at the moment we still struggle uh, with the uh, volunteering because it's not that many people volunteer, even though local. So uh, the, the goal is maybe uh, we need more uh, professional volunteer so they can maintain the credibility of the uh, disabled kids in the, at the club. Thank you very much. So we are finally some question. We are just about to, to finalize, but please. I, I, I know that these kinds of issues are being discussed for decades. Are there one or two examples that you want to emulate? I know in credit card business, you can say Bank of America or something else, or airlines, the Singapore airline. What is the gold standard for this problem, if any? Well, I'm, I'm not, uh, I can't tell you what the gold standard is. I think it's important to learn from other examples. So that's why I just gave this example of Living Goods, which is a very um, impactful organization. And I try to learn from them and see what is really working. So that's why this technology de development, but also supervision. I noticed that, you know, I, I learned about, okay, one supervisor on 20 volunteers, that's working instead of one on 40. So. Um, um, it will be a big uh, learning process in the coming years, but um, uh, that's okay. No, no I think the, um, uh, we have also been talking about that for a decade, and, and especially I remember with WHO uh, when we, we launched these CBR guidelines in 2005, to, we revised them and we were talking about what could be the sustainability, and I think what we have learned and what seems to work now it's to involve lo local government, municipalities. I think that's really where things are happening, where now there is a little trend to have some fiscality at local level. Uh, on, it's, it's not a hazard that we have around the table some Asian country from Nepal, Indonesia, uh, but also uh, um, from India. I remember also in the Philippines, we have the same trend where now municipalities have the capacity, they have their own budget, so they have the capacity, if they're a strong uh, advocacy eh, from the, the people, from parents, from the community to develop social services for personal disability, it is a possibility uh, to, uh, to develop that and to maintain this kind of support to, to develop social workers uh, paid by the municipality or to develop uh, private model, social and enterprise. I think we have to innovate. In the, in the past, we were just thinking about the public government, civil servant from the national states to maintain the CBR approach. We know that now it will not be uh, a possibility because, social re because resources are really uh, uh, rare now and we cannot really count on the national uh, strong uh, policies on social services, but at local level things are happening and at private level things are happening now and I, I, hope, I hope it is the future of a CBR approach for children with disability but also adults with disability. So let's follow up very closely the different initiatives that are happening from the civil society and corporate side to create and invent a new model of uh, duplication and scaling up of this very important aspect, how to provide 
quality proximity services for children with disability. Thank you very much for your time, for being with us this afternoon. And uh, I close the session and uh, leave you, I leave the floor to the, the next one. Thank you very much, everybody.